All right. Good evening, everybody. Good to see you. Welcome to our one of our events for Black History Month. Today we have a spoken word and celebration of culture. We have two amazing artists joining us today. We have Mr. Preston Clark and Mr. Khalil Blue. And so what I'm going to do first is stop sharing my screen so that we can do a couple of intros. Um, and so we're going to start with three questions for our artists. The first one is, when and how was your love for poetry born? Then why did you choose to be at this event? And then lastly, what is one thing you are doing for Black History Month to celebrate it or however you want to answer that question? So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. And then give me a second to put that in the questions in the chat. Um, let's see here. All right. Would either of you gentlemen like to go first? Go ahead, little bro. <laughs> what's up? What's up? What's up? I'll kick it off. How you guys doing? Um, I'm Khalil Blue. I, sorry, I just got to pause. What's up, bro? So good to see you. Uh, <laughs> it's good to be here with you all. Thank you for having me, um, Susana, and, and, and all of you all. Um, so question number one, when and how was my love of poetry born? Um, it's a little bit of a story, <laughs> yeah. um, but I was uh, a kid in school that needed a lot of uh, care and attention. <laughs> and um, I was also kind of navigating a lot of challenges in my personal life as a young person and um, not necessarily finding a lot of connection with my teachers and people that were around me at school. Um, and um, long story short, I was getting in trouble a lot. And um, one of the ways um, I had a guidance counselor um, that knew a little bit about uh, the things that I was experiencing. And um, rather than giving me punishments in school, she gave me poems and she gave me stories that um, of artists that had different um, stories to tell like mine or that were facing different challenges. And so it was on the page that I, um, for the first time in my life that I saw and heard voices of people like me and that really turned on um, my love of poetry. Um, and then, uh, um, after cultivating that relationship, um, I got an opportunity to write for the first time, um, and and it, the rest is history. I've been <laughs> put in a uh, pen to page, um, and, and and gracing the stage pretty much ever since then. Um, so that that's that. Do should we do all three in an order, or do we want to? We can do back? one and one though. We kind of stay on the topic. Let's do that. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that beautiful story. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, always good to hear your voice, bro. Uh, good to see you. Um, but yeah, uh, mine's a. Uh, I was always a reader, so me and me and my me and my love for words um, really started really early. But poetry itself, um, my senior year in high school, um, I got an extra credit opportunity to write a short story. Um, after we had a, uh, we had a another assignment where we had to write one sentence to start a novel. And I wrote mine and I read it in class and like everybody's jaw was on the floor. And I was like, yo, that was, that was good. And they were like, yeah. And my teacher said, can you make that longer? And so I wrote a short story and read it to the class. And she said, if you keep writing short stories, I'll keep giving you extra credit. And I was like, you ain't said nothing but a word. So, um, so I started writing short stories. And then when I got to college, I joined this group called Spark One. And everyone in the group was a poet except for me. I was the wild card because I wrote short stories. But my friends in the group kept telling me that if I stripped the language of my short stories, I was a narrative poet. Um, I just didn't know it yet. And so I started working at it, working at it, working at it. And then the first poem I actually had to memorize and perform was for, um, for an AIDS event we had in college. Uh, the AIDS awareness event and I memorized it and it still has my favorite line I ever wrote in it um my favorite poetry line I ever wrote in it it was um as our words intertwine and our hearts crisscross Christ christened our combination the second coming of Adam and Eve and I've loved that line for forever um but that was my first poem that I actually like sat down and like edited it 
and went through the whole process and wrote more lines that nobody actually saw. Um, just really, truly went through the process. And ever since then, that's when I really started to, to dive into it, to perform. Um, I don't perform like I used to, but I had a good maybe decade where I was really, really uh, um, heavy into it, into the craft, loving it on every level from slam to classrooms to just any stage in between. So that's pretty much kind of where my love for poetry came from was the, just the love for words then writing stories and then realizing that I was actually a poet and didn't even realize I was. Excellent, thank you so much. That's also, uh, yes, teachers, man, <laughs> they do great things. <laughs> I'm glad you all are here. All right, let's go on to our second question. So why did you choose to be at this event? And we can start with Blue. Hey, um, so I, I chose to be here. Uh, the most obvious reason I was invited. Thank you very much. Um, and I absolutely love you. Uh, and um, I, um, I think beyond that, any opportunity that I have to be in a space with my community, um, and especially that is centered around young people, um, you can pretty much sign me up for that any day, any time. Um, I will, I'll, I'll be there for that. Um, I think that, uh, my whole my whole life is pretty much dedicated to young people and i think that there's something um special and something critical about young folks having access to the arts and to artists themselves um and if it was not if it were not um for opportunities like this that i had access to um as a young person to see um to see myself in art or to access um things um, that was outside of my immediate world, I may have, um, I may have not had the opportunity to be here today. Um, so I feel like, um, I think it's, it's important for, for artists to contribute to these spaces and for educators, um, you know, like Asusena to continue to cultivate these spaces um, so that folks like us, um, so that young people have access to the expansion of folks like us and, and all the possibility models um, that are right next door to them. Because I I grew up in the Southeast, didn't always know um, that my city was as dope as it was. I didn't know that we were that cool. You know, a lot of work went into, into leading us to believe something otherwise. And, um, and so I try to do my best whenever possible um, to reflect um, who we are. <laughs> back to the people I care about the most, so. Beautiful, thank you. What yeah, about you, Mr. Clark? I mean, very similarly. Um, one, uh, I can't, it's very hard for me to say no to you. Uh, <laughs> but when you so when you call, um, uh, I'm gonna say yes 99.2% um, of the time. Uh, and, um, and light blue is just, you know, Anytime I can work with kids, anytime I can be in the community, anytime I can educate, um, I'm always going to be uh, available or at least try to make myself available. Uh, the, the art scene, I mean, and writing as a whole, writing to save my life, um, to be quite honest. Um, in moments where I couldn't depend on other people, um, even those who love me, like writing never failed me, you know, words never failed me. Um, so anytime I can, express that to others um, and bring others into the written word. Um, I'm always open to doing so. And the earlier, the better. And so the fact that, um, you know, Lemon Grove is doing such amazing things in education. Uh, I always like to refer to Lemon Grove Middle School as having uh, assembled the Avengers of education. Um, I love, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of the women who are currently uh, running um, the school in Lemon Grove. Uh, one of my dear friends is now a teacher at, at that same school. So it's just, um, I'm now from Chicago, from where I'm at right now, I've pretty much adopted Lemon Grove Middle School as my second to my actual uh, middle school. I grew up in Southeast San Diego as well. So I went to Keeler, um, but I got all the love in the world for Lemon Grove and the work that they're doing. So anytime I can, I can join in and be a part of it, um, I'm definitely willing to do so. Excellent. And likewise, there's a lot of love from Lemon Grove 
to you yes. and both of you. So thank you. Thank you for being here again. All right. That takes us to our last question for our artists. Uh, what is one thing you are doing uh, to celebrate Black History Month? And we can go back to Mr. Khalil Blue. Ooh, Black History Month. Uh, it's been actually, I just wanted to copy paste. Yeah, shout out to the Negro middle, like y'all popping over there. Um, and uh, I think Black History Month, I've been leaning more into family history um, and like really, really um, getting to know myself more and um, trying to build a stronger connection um, to my own roots and figure out ways to tell those stories. Um, and so I've been really um, spending a lot of time with family um, and doing a lot of work to um, to preserve the history that's present right now. Because um, I kind of view history um, in a very Sankofa kind of way. Like, it's just we kind of tied to it on a continual basis. So um, I'm I'm learning a lot and, and celebrating a lot and spending a lot of time with my niece and, and my brothers and um, and really, really honoring um, really the, the story that's being um, written about us right now. And, and I'm, I'm enjoying that. So that's, uh, that's how I'm celebrating Black History this month. Beautiful. And, but, uh, yeah. One thing I've, I've, I've really, uh, um, come to realize is that Black History Month is not necessarily for Black people. Um, it's for others to join in on the celebration that we already do throughout the year. Because um, I, I celebrate Black History 365 days a year. Um, it's just that February allows for a moment in time where we can be the focus um, in all spaces. And so like the school I work at now, we do a black history fact every day throughout the whole school year. Um, and so we're constantly learning about black history. But what I'm realizing is, is that this is a time for us to really educate others um, on, our, on our history um, and to allow for those types of conversations to be held. Um, I just recently um, just posted on Facebook the fact that you know Black History Month started off as Black History Week. And that's the reason why we have February, not because it's uh, the shortest um, month of the year, but because Frederick Douglass's birthday is in February. And that's why Carter G. Woodson chose um, February for Black History Month um, or Black History Week first. And, and a lot of, and I didn't, and I just posted it just to kind of let everybody just to kind of say it. And there were people on my timeline who did not know. And so I felt like, that was my space to be able to to educate others, not just my students, not just young people, but adults alike. Because a lot of times we get we don't know, um, you know, the history of those that are standing around us. Um, one of the things that frustrated me the most being in California doing K through 12 is I went to school with so many um, Asian Americans and so many um, Latin Americans and Mexican Americans and didn't and didn't know their history. And I felt so bad about that. I'm like, I'm walking around with you all. You guys are my friends. These are people that I love and appreciate. And I didn't know enough about them. And I felt like as educators um, and as adults, we need to make sure that we're spreading that news about our own um, people, about our own cultures. Um, I love the fact that, you know, we have Black History Month. We have Women's History Month. We have Hispanic Heritage Month. We have... Um, we have Pride Month, we have um, uh, all these different months that we can really truly focus and hone in on a lot of the history that gets looked over um, in, our, in our country. So um, I'm always going to be a proponent for just spreading that information and having as many people as possible join in on the celebration because all it is, a, it's a celebration of people, a celebration of humanity, celebration of those who are right next to us every day. And um, the more I can participate in that, the better. Thank you, that was beautifully said. And I so appreciate all of your response and your heart and 
we can tell, or I can tell your passion is there uh, for being here. So I appreciate you. So with that, we're going to move on to introductions from our audience. I'm going to put the questions in the chat and I'll also show um, on the screen. So if anybody in our audience is able and willing uh, to unmute, or if you choose to, you can also put it in the chat. If you wanted to list your name, your school, and if you're a student, your grade level, if you're the student's uh, parent or caregiver, your child's grade level. And then you can let us know why did you choose to be at this event? And then one thing you're doing uh, or your family is doing for Black History Month. Um, so go ahead and unmute and you can answer all three and then we'll go on to the next person. And I'm gonna stop sharing so we can see everybody. And I see Ms. Mattel with her hand up. Go ahead. Hi, um, I actually know Ronald Clark. <laughs> and uh, what's good, Sarah? How you doing? I'm good. I'm just happy to see you. <laughs> uh, my daughter is actually here. Uh, we won the raffle for your book. I'm sorry I haven't had the luxury of purchasing the first book or even reading it, but I know it's amazing. So definitely going to get back on that. Um, but um, I am, my daughter attends Vista La Mesa, um, amazing school, but shout out to Keeler, of course. Um, but, you know, I was also raised in Southeast San Diego. So like uh, kind of to piggyback on what Ronald said, you know, um, I grew up with nothing but black friends, you know, and ignorantly enough, like he said, I didn't know much of their history other than what was taught to us in school. <laughs> So having a daughter now that is black, you know, I try to, I try my hardest to kind of dig in, read, uh, attend events and things like that, you know, to kind of tell her that this, this is true, but this is more of the truth, you know, of your history. You know, I'm not black. So I try to read up on as much as I can to inform my daughter. So she's not ignorantly walking around thinking, you know, what's what when she you know try to show her what's what you know and um you know thankfully enough she's been able to be blessed enough to attend a lot of black empowered events she was in a music video for black b is for black girl by some of our childhood friends you know so it's been amazing you know to see her kind of grow and like learn and be willing to learn i'm very blessed and thankful that she's able to attend this zoom event today so she can see that, hey, look, mommy got some cool friends, you know, got some little artist friends, you know, but um, Black History Month, like you said, is 365 days a year for us, for her, and particularly for her. I emphasize it for her because of, you know, what's going on in the world today. Um, I don't want her to blindly be walking out into the world not knowing what's going on and, you know, especially for herself being Black, you know. <laughs> Um, so it's it's great for me. Love Lemon Grove School District. Love the fact that they attended this event. Love the fact that I actually know people in this event, you know. Um, but shout out to both of you guys. You know, it's amazing the work that you guys are doing. It's amazing for the work that a lot of our Southeast uh, friends are actually doing now, becoming artists, you know, through poetry, music. Um, love the fact that a lot of my friends are teachers now. So I know that my children will be growing up with a lot of you guys teaching them, you know, and things like that. And like I said, you know, I'm really glad that my daughter's here. You know, she gets to meet you guys. She gets to read these books, the local artists. You know, I love buying from black artists, especially local, you know, just so she can read and see like, hey, you know, Southeast isn't just full of rappers. You know, there's artists, there's poets, there's authors, there's musicians, you know, it's, it's amazing, but like you said, you know, Black History Month is 365 days a year for us in our house, not just February. So shout out to you guys. Shout out to the, you know, the creators of this event. Thank you for inviting us, you know. Yeah, just thank you for inviting us. It's been amazing. Thank you so much, Miss um, Mattel. And I'm also from Southeast San Diego, so there's a lot of Southeast representation. <laughs> and I think Miss Hazlett is also from Southeast. I grew up in Southeast, so. Southeast yes. and Logan yes. Heights. There you go. Can I so do we're my doing introduction today. real quick? Yes, go know. ahead, um, please. <laughs> all right, I don't want to be rude and pop out. I see my peoples are in here. What's up, Bartholomew? 
What's going on? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> um, hello, I'm Tarazi Hazlett, proud assistant principal of Lemon Grove Academy Middle School under the leadership of Tamara Muhammad and also Vanessa Ruiz, also RISE members. Um, born and raised in Logan Heights, went to school in Southeast, graduated from Gompers in 98. Yeah, I said 98. And now we're leading the equity work here at Lemon Grove in real time. And we're just happy to be here and um, having an opportunity to make sure the admin staff reflect the demographics of our students and making sure we embed restorative practices in everything we do and push the needle and thread on having culturally relevant pedagogy in our classrooms, which is a hard task to do every day, you guys, but we're here for it. I just appreciate uh, Susina hosting this event and seeing our Southeast people in the house and just the beautiful representation. And of course, being the parent of a young black male in sixth grade, Black History Month is all year long. And right now, I think my highlight for him is connecting him with a village of men who look like me. So as he grows up, he doesn't have just me to lean on, but other people and positive images and role models, which I think are very important for young men. So um, I do have my master's class tonight and I got to pick him up, but I just wanted to hop in, show my face and show my love. Um, and just that, you know, I appreciate you guys and feel free to stop by anytime we can host an event, we can do something. Lemon Grove is all about making sure culture is represented throughout the school year. Yes, thank you. Beautifully said. And that's it. That's what families are asking for. And that's what we want to give them. So we'll be in touch for sure. I know me and uh, Khalil are already talking about some collaboration for um, some suicide, suicide prevention training and good stuff coming to Lemon Grove. Um, so I'm <clears throat> uh, just going to go ahead and open up space if anybody else in the audience wants to introduce themselves and answer the questions, your name, your school, uh, child's grade level, why you chose this event, and what your family is doing for, uh, for Black History Month. Hi, my name is Estefania Lopez. Uh, my daughter goes to LGAM. Her name is Jackie Jacqueline. She's in seventh grade. And I also work for the preschool program in Lemon Grove District. And I'm always interested in the Black History Month. I always like coming to the Pan American and just like to learn new things. Every year they have something I always like to join. Before the pandemic, I used to go to, uh, my daughter used to go to elementary in San Miguel. And when they had uh, the Black History Month, we always went in person, but now it's on Zoom, but I like to learn new things all the time. What's going on in the world. We love everybody. And that's why I'm here. And thank you for inviting me, Ms. Garcia. Nice to see everybody. Of course, thank you for joining us. And I appreciate you being so active and going to a lot of, a lot of our events. All right, cool. anybody else in the audience uh, that would like to introduce themselves before we go on to our performances? Alrighty then, uh, with that further ado then, we'll go ahead and we're gonna go ahead and hear two pieces from our artists each. So we'll start with um, Khalil doing a piece, then we'll go back to Preston, then back to Khalil and then Preston. Then we'll do a Q&A if anybody wants to ask questions. And then we have a few discussion questions um, to just talk about celebrating identity and culture and what that means for us. So whenever you're ready, Khalil, you can get started. Alrighty, uh, I guess I'll do a little uh, opener. Um, so I we wanted to celebrate a little bit of sort of celebration of culture and pride and um, self. Um, so I pulled um, I pulled a piece that um, I think does a little bit of that and on brand. Um, I also spent some time. Um, in an educational space working with uh, young people on literary arts. Um, so whenever we're asking folks to self-define or self-explore um, or even self-celebrate, um, one of my favorite things to do with new writers is to do an I am poem. <laughs> Um, and if you've never done one, they're super cool. Um, and so this piece um, is sort of written in that structure and born um, of an original I Am poem. So I'm going to do a condensed version of uh, this piece today. 
Um, it's called Transcending Perception. And if you're interested in reading the full um, piece or seeing it, um, if you are if you're ever in Liberty Station, it is um, it's actually on a poster on a wall uh, by the movie theater. So go check it out. Um, so here is um, Transcending Perceptions. I am a toffee dusted truth with a freckled splattered history. I am the message my ancestors sent here in a bottle. I am bow legs and straight talk, soul fire to say the least. I am carbon pressured, diamond in the root. I am Southeast. I am story untold and unfolding, the blueprint the ancient scrolls. I am the pages they tried to leave out of the retelling, tried to make telephone game of promise, make puzzle of policy, make pieces of my humanity. Jigsaw intersections cut me up like Bartman, see my wholeness as impossibility. I am the back this country made flag of. Striped red to the white meat, white out the blood stains, sing anthem over the sound of clanging chains, loose allegiance around my neck from gray K. Right hand over broken hearts. This land is still covered with trees that hold stories of black bodies like banner yet wave. I am the exhale and the stolen breath. I am plantation purred on page. I am freed of paper, right like ax to chain. I am the liberator. I am pressed down and run away. My body is a love story, a reclamation of our story. And I stand unapologetic, unwavering, unbent. I am safety found in a hopeless place. Grandma's hands. I'm fried chicken wings and cigarettes. I am salt and pepper on the radio and lorries on everything else. I am home. I am black man, majestic. I am miracle, built of vibranium and a Nana's backbone. I am Baldwin's voice and Thurgood's gavel. I am Valerie's kiss. I am Malcolm's wisdom. I am Nina's song and Coretta's fist. I am the story, the diary of Philando's daughter. I am Mahalia's praise. I am Harriet's footprints. I am Josephine Baker's rhythm. I am Mamie Till's rage and Langston's wrist. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I forgot to mention before we got started, um, whenever there's spoken word if you're feeling something feel free to react with the heart or the clap or whatever reaction you want on zoom you can clap your finger or snap your fingers on camera you can add things um uh, in the chat just to give that energy to the artist and um if we were live we could also even shout out and things but it's just with the mic it doesn't work out uh, sadly on zoom but we'll do our best uh, to improvise but yes, that was a beautiful, beautiful piece. Thank you so much, Khalil. And um, we'll go on to Ronald. So um, this is what I get for going after my little brother. Um, <laughs> his brilliant self, it was just bars after bars after bars. Um, it's funny with uh, when you end up in, in spaces of academia with kids is you go back and realize that too many of your poems are inappropriate. So um, find <laughs> so find, so finding poems that you actually can do in public settings that aren't adults um, is always a fun process. Uh, so I dug in my bag a little bit, wanted to make sure I stayed on topic um, of you know of Black History Month and identity. Um, so I found one that I haven't read in a really long time, uh, but um, hope you all enjoy it. All right. His bones cracked of history. Veins told stories of faraway tales, holding back the blood he shed years ago. He sat down in restaurants, fed food from, black, from back alleys, leftovers left over after the leftovers. He wasn't welcome there. Spit on for sitting on empty bar stools, spilt poured down his back like a sewage drain. His only solace was praying to whatever deity would listen. He fought on battlefields with enemies on both sides, his only purpose to gain respect from a group of peers who couldn't see his red, white, and blue heart beating. They only saw darkened skin, eyes who'd seen hate since his first blink, feet that had walked miles to school so he could go home and read to an illiterate mother and father. A generation removed from shackles and change, he was still in bondage, 
unable to walk across a pavement his ancestors built. He kissed the ground to taste their spirits. He understood his history. He didn't understand what's become of it. A new crop of black folks unaware of the crops picked from a ground he fought to allow them to walk on freely. He can't walk to the park without hearing loud profanities yelled into skies, their teenage breath blowing away spirits they didn't know were there. They unknowingly dismiss the history in their presence, laughing and mocking this slow moving man who talked to and marched with the men they skimmed over reading about in school. As he lay in his deathbed, taking his last breaths, he prayed for the new brothers. He prayed for their understanding of what they used to be and what they've become. Too bad the prayers would only be heard by those that didn't need to hear them in the first place. Wow. It's incredible to me how poetry and words and the way they're delivered can just transport you somewhere else, you know, and like you literally have to close your eyes because it's just, you're feeling so much. So um, thank you for, for making me feel all of that. And that was a, another beautiful piece. Whew, man, <laughs> let's go for another round then. <laughs> all right, Khalil, whenever you're ready. Ooh, okay. <laughs> oh man, yeah, I like uh, he's got that traveler's cadence. I feel like he's just going a long walk and listen to that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I got the second piece I'm gonna do um is another one of those <laughs> pieces we pull for positivity, um, but um, it's also one of uh one of my favorites, um that kind of captures sort of how I feel about these conversations. Um, I think we um, sometimes, how do I wanna phrase this? I think it's important um, that when we are celebrating um, black history, um, that we celebrate the whole story, right? I think we, um, a huge problem that I um, that I feel that I experience when it comes to talking about history or talking about um, <laughs> the life of existing in a black body period is that we love to cherry pick the experience um, and we we utilize the pieces that are beneficial for us at whatever moment that we're using them. Um, and I know uh, growing up as a black child that was mosaiced in that way. Um, it was hard for me to um, understand that all parts of me were valuable right? and that that there was a whole story to tell and an expansion um, and that there were so many people that were like me and, you know, not like me um, that were important to my story. Um, and so I think that uh, I grew up um, in my grandmama's house, right? <laughs> and, and she was a person that taught me a lot about, um, about love and about caring about people and about the way that you treat people and, and um, seeking to understand and get to know that, um, and build relationships with people or something. Um, someone earlier spoke to pedagogy. That was the pedagogy of my household, love. Um, and, um, and today is my grandmother's birthday. <laughs> um, so I'm excited. I bring her in the room with me um, today. And she is, also, um, she is also the Black history in my family. She is the first Black woman in my, in my family. Um, so I'm really, really excited to celebrate her um, and, and us and all of you. Um, so this piece is called Planting Seeds. Um, and I'll preface it with these words. <clears throat> we are the minds that hold the visions of a world that we are all dying to live in. So it is up to us to be the difference in the world that we want to see. You see real change starts as an idea. Then it grows on us all. It is up to us to plant the seeds. So it matters what you say and it matters what you do because if you plant the seeds in the right places, you have the power to grow up in a world that will one day grow from you. I wrote a goodbye letter today. 
I said sayonara to the old me, my usual way. See, I've been moving out of darkness and enjoying the rays, thinking about making some changes in a beautiful way. So I've been spending some time with my reflection. I've been celebrating all of the nuances in my complexion and I am grateful for this buttermilk and honey. I'm grateful for these freckles, for these better to kiss you wits, they're lovely. Mwah. And I've been celebrating you too, celebrating all of the things that we've been surviving through. And I hope that it helps us stand a little taller, stand a little more tolerant, break through our walls, find out we're rich with so much culture. Yo, it's crazy how we treat some people different for their color. We keep be behaving off our misconceptions, but won't get to know each other. But I've got this little notion my Nana taught me to spread around and I let go that maybe we are all one people, just 500 shades of brown and some are lighter, some are darker, some are bigger, some are smaller, some are thinner, some are thicker, some potato and some potato and some of us are fly and others have yet to discover that they have wings, but we're all sharing the same sky, flying towards a similar dream of equality an acknowledgement that we are all cut from the same. So let's stop spinning hate in circles. Let's stop pointing, passing blame. Let's just embrace each other's weirdness and laugh at all our flaws. We can enjoy each other's company, celebrate and have a ball. We have got to build connections with some intention to be vulnerable, reframe our minds. We think that what we have learned to think is normal. There is nothing stopping us from loving stronger today. We are well aware of the things that we need to fix and the places where we get in our own ways and so now it is our decision to create the world that we envision we're guaranteed to make the shot long as we're brave enough to throw so don't let this moment pass keeping us stuck in the past the seed is all planted now it's our responsibility to grow thank you yes thank you and i've heard this piece before but every time it's just touching and deep and positive and all the vibes that that we need. <laughs> I appreciate it so much. Okay. You ready, Ronald? <laughs> yeah. One of the biggest compliments you can give other writers is I wish I would have wrote that. Mm. Um, and there were so many lines that he dropped that I was like, I wish I would have wrote that line. I wish I would have wrote <laughs> like especially the potato potato line, like and the way you delivered it, I was like, oh, yeah, I was like, yeah. All right, all right. Way to show, way to way to show out, uh, young brother. All right. So, <laughs> um, yeah, nah, that was that was dope. Um, one thing I've always appreciated about Blue is is his vulnerability when he writes. Um, and not a lot of artists can be as vulnerable as he is on stage and on paper. Um, so it's always appreciated um, to see just how much he can bring of himself, you know, onto a stage. So. Um, but yeah, so um, the piece I'm about to read is uh, um, when Chadwick Boseman played Jackie Robinson in 42. Um, soon as I saw the movie, I immediately went home and wrote something. Um, and so this poem is in dedication to one of our legends um, who ended up being played by a man who turned into a legend. Um, and his short, in his short 40, um, 40 something years, uh, Chadwick Boseman played James Brown, um, Thurgood Marshall, uh, Jackie Robinson, and of course the incomparable Black Panther. So um, a legend playing a legend um, is a powerful, powerful space. So that's where this poem derives its energy and I'm going to read it to you now. All right. God sculpted him in his image. He was built to last. Selected to carry the burden of a chance at inclusion in a sport sick with society's ailments, he had to be different. He had to be strong. Strong enough to not show off his strength he was faster than everyone, stronger than everyone, better than everyone, but he couldn't tell anyone what we already knew. He was a statue built out of actions, chose hallways to unleash his angst, cried in the bosom of his Eve, swallowed his temper, choked on his pride. He recognized the size of his position. It took some time, 
the money was the first enticement. Then he heard the applause and he looked into the eyes of little boys who displayed dark skin like him, dusted their bats like him, sprinted around the bases like him, looked at a racially explosive league and said, I can do that like him. He represented a thing unseen, a Negro baseball player in a white man's league, in a white man's world, taking on atrocities no one could understand but him. He represented his people, even if it started on accident, it ended in purpose. He fulfilled his purpose, leading a slowly forming assembly line of banished talents. Larry Doby, Hank Thompson, Monty Irvin, surrounded themselves in his strength, developed his keen sense of the moment, stood on his shoulders to witness a changing of the guard. They just wanted to play baseball, but they were playing with their rights, their right to play a game they loved in the most visible lead they knew. Their departure slowly dismantled the Negro leagues where they grew as men and athletes, but it was bigger than them. They had to do it. He had to do it. Jackie Robinson, why do we take you for granted even on this day where the league you forced to look at itself in the mirror dons your number on each of its players' jerseys, wearing history on their backs, tears falling down faces of men who owe you their livelihood, and yet we run the streets forgetting about your struggle, about the vitriol you endured, about the pride stuck in your throat, about the words you never said so we could have the freedom to speak our minds, run bases freely, die for borderline base hits, torture pictures with our overgrown heels, win MVPs, rookies of the year, and enter the Hall of Fame. It wasn't just a game. It was a microcosm of society and you were our centerpiece, our, guide, our guiding light, a reluctant leader whose eventual realization became our realization that this was bigger than the game, bigger than you, bigger than us. God knew not to put a name on the back of your jersey. He knew that your struggle would represent more than a name, but we tend to forget what you did and Oscar Robertson, Bill Russell, Texas Western, Charles Follis, Earl Lloyd, Chuck Cooper, Ernie Davis, all the pioneers who made our complexion a memory, our talent soaked in revelry, their souls hardened for eternity, opening unseen doors so today's athlete wouldn't have to worry, wouldn't have to lend themselves to the humanity deposited behind your eyes for you never to forget. We can't forget. We can't let your memory, your life of actions die in vain. We have to shape our lips to say thank you, Jackie Robinson for being man enough to turn the other cheek, to endure pains we will never see, for allowing us the opportunity to just play ball. Man, two perfect pieces to close us off with the performances. Thank you both so much. And, you know, we're heading to the end of Black History Month. So I feel like this is also perfect time to have this moment to celebrate and just all of your energy and, and your experiences and how you pour your hearts into the pieces that you write. I think that's why art is so powerful that you can communicate and transfer that energy to others and use it as a space for like self and community healing. And yeah, thank you. Thank you for existing, both of you, <laughs> bottom line. <laughs> oh, okay, so with that, um, let me take a breath. I want to uh, get us started with our first discussion question. We had about 10 minutes, so we'll try and get through as much as we do. And it's meant to be how it's meant to be. Um, before we start the discussion question, the first one, if anybody in the audience wants to say anything about what you just heard, um, give some words to our artists, feel free to unmute as well. I just shared in the chat, but I want to say, you know, aloud to seriously so blessed to have you both here and share your pieces and your performance just move my heart so deeply. I'm, I feel like after a long day of work, my cup is full. Um, it felt like you were pouring right from your heart into ours and, and gave us a beautiful story, a beautiful glimpse of the passion the beauty um i just really appreciate it so thank you 
Thank you very much. Anybody else want to share anything before we go to our discussion question? All right, then. With that, let's go ahead and I'm going to put the question in the chat. And the question today is, how do each of us define pride, celebration of Black History Month, celebration of pride in the self and family and Black excellence? Um, interpret that as you may. And whoever feels that they want to start us off, feel free as, as you get called into the space. Um, I'll jump in. I don't necessarily have a fully formed answer, but I'll, I'll just share at least what's um, coming up for me in response to that. Um, I think for me, pride is a practice. Um, and I think that for me as a person, like individually growing up in a place where um, both just in the streets and like in church, frankly, um, they they sort of shame you out of pride, right? <laughs> and, and pride is something that gets introduced as like danger, it gets introduced as sin, it gets introduced as something that you're not necessarily um, supposed to have out loud. Um, and I think that in these days and what I try to model um, and invite the young people I share space into is understanding like like pride is a is a practice of self-love, right? It's a it's a practice of noticing. It is a practice of 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 pausing and and celebrating on purpose, um, even in the micro. And I think that learning to be proud of myself um, meant paying attention to who I was and how I show up, even um, sometimes that like means paying attention to, to how you walk, how you, you know, how you walk in a room, the pres the energy that you give off, the things that you've selected for yourself as a form of expression, a way for people to meet you. Um, all of that is something to rejoice in. And so I, I, I practice that um, in the mirror, literally, <laughs> um, on a daily basis, spending that time with myself. Um, I practice um, noticing things that I accomplish, dreams that I attach to and chase after. Um, I celebrate the journey and not just the, the beginning and end point. Um, and I think for that translates and maybe is probably even stems from um, the way in which I'm learning um, and have learned to celebrate my people. Um, I spoke earlier to the idea of cherry picking and there was all of this, um, you know, <laughs> there was a template of, you know, these three people represent in <laughs> Black history, right? Or, you know, these, <laughs> you know, three events, you know, every, every version of us was a slave or every very, like every, there's just a very, um, like Black history has always had a brand. And, um, the way in which I, I practice pride these days is by stretching outside of that as much as possible um, and, and learning the, the nuance um, and the rest of the parts of the story that, that help to make those three people matter <laughs> or these moments in history um, that inform why we talk about them. Because it's not that those people aren't worth celebrating. There's just so much more um, to the story. And, and if, if you look deep enough, you can find your connection to it. Um, and so the pride um, for me these days is, is really about that, that discovery and that practice um, and that continual micro incremental repetitive celebration um, of, of everything, every reason I could find to love me and love the people around me. <laughs> It's it's funny, Blue, because um, we tell kids, we tell people to have high self-esteem, and then when they showcase high self-esteem, we tell them to be quiet and be humble, and which is the weirdest thing. Nobody does anything well without confidence, 
So if you're going to constantly be beating the confidence out of people, then you're actually perpetuating a contradiction. Um, and I had to learn because people tried to beat my confidence out of me for years and years and years um, because they viewed it as something bad. And I'm like, there are quiet people who are conceited and there are loud people who are the most humble human beings on the planet. Um, and so it comes back to, like you said, that the practice of self-love um, and recognizing that um, if you focus on being the best version of you you can be, you're going to add to your ancestor's story. Uh, one of my favorite phrases of the last few years is, um, I am my ancestor's dreams. Like, this is what my ancestors dreamed about is who I am right now. And that's a beautiful space to always live in. And um, one of my favorite things to do with my students, and even though I teach humanities, and I was saying you're gonna love this being a, uh, being a math person, uh, is there was this post that came out called Ancestral um, Mathematics. Yeah, and yeah, and, uh, and, it, and I had my kids like figure out, like uh, I said, look at how many people it took to make you. Like you have your parents, then your parents' parents, then their parents, and it just keeps multiplying. And when you get to like, I think it was like the ninth or twelfth or something like that generation, it's like four thousand something people. That's fourth, and that's just going back nine generations. And so that's four thousand something people's blood who are running through you right now, who are making you you right now, and you are their living embodiment. And I feel like that is. That is where my pride comes from, is knowing that so many people um, had to live and die in order for me to live right now. And so who would I be to disrespect that by not attempting to be great, by not attempting to take advantage of my opportunities, to take advantage of the talents that I've cultivated. Um, there it is, yep. Uh, the talents that I've cultivated over time um, because like Denzel Washington said, the only people who are talking about you aren't, are, you'll never have somebody talk about you who's doing better than you. It's always somebody who's not. <laughs> and so um, you have to carry yourself with a particular confidence and while still allowing others to be the ones to, to elevate you. Um, but like Khalil said, in the morning, you look at yourself in the mirror and say, let's go be great today. Let's go be excellent today because I'm getting a day that others aren't getting. And as a black man in our society and so many of my friends not reaching the age of 35 that I am right now, I'd be disrespecting them if I didn't try to be great every day I walk out the door um, when they're not able to be here and do the same. So um, that's kind of where I kind of find my space is just trying to represent my people, my legacy um, and my family at the highest level. Um, because at the end of the day, as long as they're proud of me, and long as I can say I put my best foot forward and I didn't leave anything on the table, then I can die a happy man. So uh, that's kind of the energy that I'm kind of finding when it comes to Black History Month, especially because this is just one of the 12 months that I'm already being Black and being prideful and being, ex uh, I love, uh, what, what do we say during this month? Um, this month I'm Blackity Black. Like every month I'm black, but this month I'm black and black, right? <laughs> and so it's just a different kind of energy during February, but it never stops. And, and that energy is necessary in order for us to continue the legacy that we built. Wow. Yes, thank you. Um, we do have about a minute. Well, it's 6.30 already, but <laughs> before we wrap it up, I if anybody from our families wants to share, I would love to hear from you and your experience. And then um, after everyone has had a turn, I just have two announcements uh, for events coming up for our district. And then we, I can let you go. <laughs> or if you need to leave, feel free. Um, but if anybody feels called to share, please, please do so. I want to say, okay, me and Joe went to the same college, baby. So we both went to Hampton University. That's my big brother, right? What a small world, man. 
Okay. <laughs> Everybody knows Ronald. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ali Zed and Sarah's Sarah's brothers. I've known since second grade. So. Oh man. Yeah. 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 Tell him um, I said. <laughs> I will. I will. He's actually kind of listening. It kind of eavesdropping outside, so he can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I think just real. I think just real quick. Um, I think my experience with pride, like I said, I grew up with nothing but um black friends you know it wasn't until high school that I had a more uh select friends culture wise and race wise um but my daughter I think is the only student from the Lemon Grove district that's actually here on the zoom but she's kind of uh she's kind of shy right now um but like I said you know I try to I try to encourage her to like attend events like this so she can see other people who look just like her you know um I think we can all agree that I can say from my own experience, I didn't grow up with a lot of kids that were mixed of mixed race, you know, so it's a little different now that we have a ton of kids that are mixed with black, Panama, you know, Islander, Mexican, you know, all those different cultures. Um, but I think um, one thing, like I said, I try to encourage is to, for her to attend events with people that look like her, you know, um, cause unfortunately, you know, She's not just someone, you know, she, people look at her and she's black, but then some people look at her and she's not black, you know, so it's kind of hard for her to stay encouraged. So, you know, like I'm texting back and forth with her right now, you know, just telling her, just listen to these guys, you know, this is my friend, you know, like just listen to them, be encouraged, you know, so that she can take pride, you know, in who she is as a person, you know, she didn't get to pick who she is. She didn't get to pick how she looked. But to see you two amazing artists could possibly yeah. encourage her to see that our district is full of Black excellence and Pan American excellence, just minorities in general, you know, I think will encourage her and other kids, you know, to say, hey, I'm Black and I'm proud. You know, I'm Samoan and I'm proud. I'm Mexican and I'm proud. It don't matter. You know, like, I'm proud. You know, like you said, um, try to practice self-love. And that's what I try to encourage her daily, you know. Um, so I hope that she gets that at least from this event and other events, you know, that try to preach that to our kids. You know, it's it's a different time that our kids are living in. So, um, like I said, thank you to Lemon Grove. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to the YouTube artists, you know, Khalil, uh, Lil, Rodney, Lil Ronald, you know, thank you guys, you know, uh, for putting this together. It's amazing, you know, and I hope my daughter can at least take that away from this. Yeah, man. man, you Thank know somebody you. Know, you know somebody know me for a long time when they call me Lil Ron. I was just gonna say, like, when was the last time you heard that one? A little black history for you. <laughs> you had you had that met me before I turned 18 to call me Lil Ron because uh, I live down the West Coast. Yeah. <laughs> Hi Ivana. I hope Hi. I said your name right. <laughs> Hi. Do you want to share something with us? It's good to see you. That, that's my baby, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Look at all that hair. I know. Beautiful. Hi, baby. <laughs> I, grew up, I grew up Black and wasn't able to really say anything because I was a really shy kid. And now that I'm in the sixth grade, I speak up to change the world and show people that Black people have a place on this earth and that we aren't just people who don't have feelings and that we take things in as, as any other human should. And my mom has always taught me not to let anybody get to me with any racial comments. And I now realize like racial comments can hurt in the way people say them. And now it's just like, I am black and I will not be able to change that. And for people to continue making fun of people for being black isn't funny because like, at the end of the day, we didn't ask to be black. Mm -hmm. Powerful, powerful, powerful. That's, that's, what she's, that's so beautiful. I love it. Yes. Look, I'm getting ready to run around the sanctuary. Here. I, know. <laughs> I love when the babies get to talking. Yes. Yes. She yes. plays football. She plays football just oh. like Johnny. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> she, she, she's in y'all's family. I, I <laughs> You want, you want to know what's funny, though? A real quick story that's going, and I hope, um, Sarah, uh, pronunciation of your daughter's name? Eviana. Eviana. Okay, that's a beautiful name. Thank you. Um, 
for Eviana. So I was in seventh grade at Keeler Middle School. Um, and uh, I'm in a seventh, I'll never forget, I'm in seventh grade, I'm in my history class and I have a Latino teacher and I have a white classmate. Her name was Gwen Alexander. And she was sit sitting in front of me and she asked our teacher, why wasn't there a white history month? And so I raised my hand and said, can I answer this? <laughs> and my teacher was like, sure. And I was like, so I turned to her and I said, we learn about y'all all year. I said, we get one month for you to learn about me. I know way more about you than you'll ever know about me because of the way our schools are set up. And so I answered it. Fast forward 20 some odd years later, uh, well, not 20, maybe 15 years later, she finds me on Facebook, the girl that I said it to, tells me that she's in school for uh, um, educational, uh, um, like racial policy within education or something along those lines at UCLA. And she tells me that what started her on her journey was the comment I made to her in seventh grade. And so I tell you that, Iviana, because always speak up because you never know who's listening, you never know who needs to hear you, and you never know what impact your words might have on someone. So I love the mentality you already have. Keep that up because you, not, you have no idea what kind of impact you could potentially have on somebody who can, that can change their life. So keep that head exactly where you're at. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing great, great things about you in the future. Beautiful. So two comments um, and then the announcements to wrap us up. Uh, first of all, I am so glad that you said everything you said, um, Sarah, because I know for a fact there are so many families in Lemon Grove that feel the way you feel, which is why we're putting these events together, which is why we're going to continue to do this and calling out parents so that eventually we get them all to see this is where we're at as a district and we're trying to move in that direction and move forward. So feel free whenever there's another event to tell your friends and tell your family and just get the word out. Um, and then for Eviana, so not sure if you're aware, but we have a parent committee called the Black and Pan-African Student Excellence. We're gonna have a meeting again on March 10th um, and we're trying to highlight Black excellence within our students. So uh, Eviana, if you're willing to read that piece um, at that um, next meeting or record yourself so we can share it at either that or the next meeting, I would love to do that. Um, I can get in touch with you both and invite you to our next meeting because we need you. We need you and our district to strengthen our community. Um, so that's one thing. And then I'm gonna go on to two announcements. And then um, if Mr. Um, Joe Smith wants to add anything after that, uh, can you guys see the youth chess tournament? Um, is that what you see on your screen? Yes. Okay, great. So on Saturday, March 5th, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., we are having a youth chess tournament and family fair at the Lemon Grove Rec Center. And kids signed up to be in the tournament. That's not the only thing going on. We're going to have a teen mobile center with games and video games. There's going to be a, a video game truck, laser tag. We're having a local taco shop come in and um, sell food. And then we're trying to get vendors to sign up and uh, give family services about COVID, healthcare, um, you know, like COVID relief stuff that's available. Uh, the DA's office is showing up and a lot of other vendors are going to be around just to share and connect our families to a lot of services. So that's happening. The other thing that's happening next month, we're having family focus groups. So they're going to be led by Fatherhood Alliance. Um, and that's Mr. Joe Smith's organization as part of a district equity audit. What that means is we're getting information from families, from students, from staff to see is our district doing what's needed to be done to provide equity for our families and our students. And then there's not gonna be any admin or school staff present. So families are able to confidentially really truly share how they feel, their honest opinion, both positive and negative. We need all the info we can get so that we can move forward and reform and get our district to where our families and students deserve it to be. Um, at each of the focus groups, there's gonna be uh, 12 100 honorariums that will be raffled at each focus group. So if more than 12 families show up, 12 of them will get $100. And you can participate 
in all focus groups, there's going to be a school side focus group and then three additional um, district wide focus groups, one for special education families, one for African American families and one for multilingual families. If you qualify to participate in all four, then you have a chance to get $100 at each of the events. Uh, if you're interested, I'll put the link in the chat to participate or you can send me an email at azucena.garcia at lemongrovesd.net. Here are the dates you'll be receiving. I know I've been posting on Class Dojo about them. There's going to be an infant and campus messaging, and then you're going to be receiving a call from your school also to kind of remind you and see if you're interested in participating. I think our schools today are Vista La Mesa, so that will be on Tuesday, March 8th from 6.30 to 8. It's all via Zoom, um, so you don't have to worry about getting baby a babysitter and all of that stuff. So you can be at home with your children. Please show up. And then here are the dates for the district ones. Our special education is Tuesday, March 29th, 4.30 to 6. Uh, district African-American, March 10th, 6 to 7.30. And the multilingual also might March 10th, 6 to 7.30. I can email that to all of our uh, families present today. Um, but we're just trying to get the word out because we need our voice, like our families' voices to be heard and to really share their genuine experience. So I'll stop sharing, and I don't know if Mr. Joe Smith wants to add anything or uh, Becky. Well, can I add something? Mm -hmm. Since we're talking about pride, I was just saying that I am proud of you. You killing, you are killing the game, and that is beautiful. And I remember early talks of your vision of you talking about this and to be existing in it is gorgeous. And please don't stop. You are you are doing the thing. So, so shout out, shout out, shout out. Thank you guys. It it helps to see um our southeast community go places too. It just motivates us to also do our best. So I appreciate y'all and everything you're doing too. <laughs> all right, well, it is way past our time. So thank you for sticking around. Um, I love you all. Blessings, good night. Keep, keep being excellent. Keep spreading that black excellence everywhere you go. And I'm sure we'll collaborate again. Um, and thank you to our families for being here as well. Have a good evening, enjoy. We'll see you later. Take Bye. care, be good y'all. Everyone. Okay. All right, Big Joe, we go.